Welcome to Box Office Receipts. I'm your host, Tyler Callahan, and it's another busy week in Hollywood. We have the latest numbers, of course, but also news from Disney Plus and his movie pass coming back. I'll get into that in a bit, but first, let's get to the numbers. Staying in first place for the second weekend in a row is Eternals with $27.5 million for a total of $118.8 million. Opening in second place is Clifford the Big Red Dog with $16.4 million for a total of $22 million. Should point out, it did open last Wednesday, so that is why the numbers are a bit different. Dune came in third place with $5.5 million for a total of $93.1 million. Fourth place was No Time to Die with $4.6 million for a total of $150.5 million. Lastly, in fifth place was Venom Let There Be Carnage with $4 million for a total of $200.1 million. Okay, so Eternals held on pretty well with around a 62% drop. While it's not amazing, it also was not bad either and right now has the likes to get to $150 million at least and could finish in the $170 million range. For Paramount, Clifford did pretty well considering this was a late change in release. It was only a month ago they decided to release it now, so the marketing has been very start and stop. While it was questionable at times, it's now a lock. Dune will pass $100 million domestically and could finish around $110 million. No Time to Die has passed the $150 million mark. And Venom has finally, after five weeks, passed the $200 million mark domestically. This makes it the second film to do it this year, the first being Shang-Chi. With Eternals not being able to do it, the next and last film that will pass that this year is Spider-Man No Way Home. Also, while not in the top 5 anymore, I have been keeping an eye on anime films in America. My Hero Academia World Hero Mission has passed 10 million. This puts it around 40 million for a worldwide total. Not bad, but it does not come close to Demon Slayer. Those numbers were insane. And right before we get to numbers from China, we did get an announcement that the current number 1 movie in the world, The Battle of Lake Changin, will be premiering domestically November 19th by CMC Pictures. While it's nice it will get a theatrical release, I doubt it'll do any big numbers for two reasons. First, most Chinese films here only get a limited release, not a wide release. And if they do get it, it's only for two or three weeks. Right now, it's not clear how many theaters will be showing it. Second, even if it gets a wide release, the subject matter will turn people away from it. China as the good guys, and America as the adversaries. Speaking of China, let's take a look at their numbers. Opening in first place was B Somebody with 20 million. Opening in second place was... And Tia with 6.3 million. Third place was the Battle of Lake Changin with 4.5 million for a total of 882 million. Fourth place was No Time to Die with 4.3 million for a total of 57.9 million. Lastly, in fifth place was Jungle Cruise, which opened to 3.3 million. So, not a great number for Jungle Cruise, but to be fair, it did do better than Snake Eyes. Not only that, but it also did receive better user reviews, with it having an 8.9 on Moyen. This is more of an issue that there have been HD streams since the movie premiered in July, thanks to Premiere Access. So anyone who really wanted to see it could have looked for any of those in the past few months. No Time to Die is holding well as it gets close to 60 million. Again, it won't pass Spectre's total, which was around 80 million. But finishing around 60, 65 million is pretty good. Now, let's look at the worldwide numbers. Eternals made 48 million for a total of 281.4 million. Venom Let There Be Carnage made 7.7 million for a total of 441.5 million. Dune made 6.8 million for a worldwide total of 351.2 million. Finally, No Time to Die has passed 700 million worldwide, and it is now only 12 million behind F9 for being the biggest Hollywood movie of the year. It will pass that in a few days, and we'll enjoy that title for about a month until Spider Man No Way Home. Moving on now to the news from Hollywood, where there has been a lot going on this week, as I mentioned earlier. A uh, follow-up from a few weeks ago, the IATSE has voted to ratify the new contract with the studios. This means the possibility of a strike is now over, and production will continue in Hollywood for another three years before things will have to be renegotiated. The vote was close enough that the delegate count being at 256 to yes, to 188 voting no. This shows that there are quite a few people not happy with the deal, so expect there to be a major push to improve it in a few years. Let's talk about new projects first. Deadline has the exclusive on this one, and that is a animated Dr. Seuss movie. Specifically, all the places you will go. Not only that, but they already have a director attached with John M. Chu signing on to the project. For Chu, this is an interesting picture, as he would be the first 
animated film he ever directed, but as it mentions in the article, he told Warner Brothers years ago he would be interested in doing one. Well now, he has his chance. As for when this will be coming out, well, not for a while. Uh, and by a while, I mean sometime in 2027. Yep, that is the earliest coming out right now, and it's kind of odd they dated that far back, but to be fair, it does take a while to do an animated film. For Warner Brothers, I think this is a great pick, with them having to deal with Dr. Seuss' estate. It's good that they are branching out to adapting his other famous works, and not just do the cat in the hat. Also, it being animated and not live action is another smart move. The Luther movie is finally in production, thanks to Idris Elba, posting a photo on Instagram confirming he is on set filming. While we do not have a release date for it, we do know a bit more about distribution, with the film being made by Netflix and the BBC. So if there is a theatrical release for it, it will likely be a limited one. Now I am curious about how this deal works. Because while Luther has been on Netflix, the BBC likes to sell the rights to anyone. Like, I've seen it on HBO Max, I've seen it on Amazon Prime. So is it going to be that the series you can watch wherever you want, but only Netflix will have the film? Or does Netflix get exclusive rights for, say, a year, and then the BBC can sell the rights to other streamers? That's something to pay attention to. Otherwise, I'm looking forward to watching it when it comes out. Deadline has another exclusive on a project, which is a remake of, you guessed it, Roadhouse. Yes, it's apparently time for the classic Patrick Swayze movie to get a remake, and MGM is the one doing it. Not only that, but they already have started to line up the people with the studio getting close to signing on Jake Gyllenhaal as the lead, with Doug Lehman directing. It should be noted that it is not clear what the remake will be. It's not even clear if Gyllenhaal will play the same character as Swayze. As for MGM looking to remake this, I'm not surprised. They do not have a lot of strong IP, so if this reboot works to the point where they can do sequels, they got another small franchise going. I don't hate the idea, just needs to be done well. Besides new movie announcements, we did get word of some delays, specifically from Paramount, with both their next Transformers and Star Trek films delayed by at least six months. Transformers Rise of the Beast was set to come out next June. That will now come out instead a year later, June 9th, 2023. Due to that move, their next Star Trek film, which was set to come out on that date, will now come out December 22nd, 2023. These moves are not too surprising, especially since Top Gun Maverick got delayed to next May. Paramount would not want to have two other blockbuster films coming out within the weeks of each other. For Star Trek, with it looking likely Rogue Squadron leaves its release date, it will give the film some breathing room and has a chance to make some decent money. Already making a move based on those changes, Warner Brothers has pushed back their Elvis biopic from June 3rd, 2022 to June 24th, 2022. News from Disney shareholders meeting that I did not have time to add in the previous episode, I wanted to mention briefly here. When asked about the company's commitment to exclusive windows for theatrical releases, CEO Bob Chappick refused to extend the commitment after 2021. Remember, a few months ago, when they committed to exclusive windows for their films, it was all the films up until the end of the year, not after. With Mr. Chappick refusing to say uh, the company would extend that to next year, he said it was important the company have flexibility with its releases. Quote, we are sticking with our plan of flexibility because we are still unsure about how the marketplace is going to react when family films come back with a theatrical first window. End quote. This is not too much of a shock, and from the company's point of view, I understand. While the Marvel films have been doing great so far, one aspect that has hurt them is the Fox releases, like The Last Duel. For them, that would have been a perfect film to have a hybrid release, as it catered more toward an older audience. As for families, we'll have to see what Encanto does in a few weeks to see how they respond to that. But the reason I bring up what he said is that what I said about theaters last week. Now is the time to innovate or risk dying, as the studios will not be there to help them. With these comments, it continues to be clear that for Disney, Disney Plus is what they're all in on for distribution. While they clearly do exclusive windows when profitable, like Marvel and Pixar movies, they will also make any move they can for a release to help Disney Plus. By not committing to exclusive windows for long periods of time, it offers them the flexibility to do this. For new trailers this week, we got the big one, the final trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home, and yeah, if it can deliver, we're looking at the first billion dollar movie since 2019. It's looking good. Also got a trailer for Downton Abbey, A New Era, which comes out next year. Finally, in adding to the 2021 Hollywood bingo card of things I did not think of, which includes the first round MCU movie, we got MoviePass trying to make a return. Co-founder Stacey Spikes was given ownership of the company, or what's left of it, by a New York bankruptcy judge this week. Why? Well, she placed an undisclosed bid for it, and it was enough for the judge to sign off on it. 
After this, Spikes did confirm to Business Insider that now she owns it, she is looking to relaunch it. In case you do not remember Movie Pass, it was a too-good-to-be-true service that crashed hard. If only $9.99 per month, you could watch all the movies in theaters you want. Then it was a few per month. Then it was not the blockbuster on an opening weekend, etc. etc. Now for it to come back using Movie Pass, well, it's going to need to pull off an amazing PR campaign to get people's trust. Right now, since they have been gone, AMC has built up a list, which has done well so far, and Regal has their own version of it as well. So if I was Movie Pass, I would focus on the affordability, but I assume, obviously, $10 would be too cheap, so say $15, $20. But the key point is that you're not tied to a theater. That's, that's the key reason. If I was Movie Pass, I'd sell them, look, with our card, with our service, you can go to any theater you want. Don't be locked into just AMC or Regal. Go to Cinemark. Go to a local theater. Go to any theater you want. Watch the movie you want. That's what I would do. You're not locked in anything. We'll see if they do it. We'll see how they try to bring themselves back. Well, well, well. Disney Plus Day happened, and thanks to that, VOD Premium has got some news. But before we get to that, there was some other smaller news that we should get to first. Due to the poor numbers last night so has gone so far, Universal has decided to release it on premium VOD on November 19th. While Universal's contract with theaters allows them to release it uh, on VOD as soon as 17 days after release, most films have stayed longer. Soho will come in at around 21, 22 days in theaters. While I do feel bad for Edgar right here, for Universal, this is a smart move, as it was not gaining traction, and this is the best way to recoup some of its money now. Deadline has another exclusive here, and that is about Apple TV Plus new movie Finch, which premiered last weekend. While Apple did not release any specific numbers, Deadline is saying that the film has already become the most watched film on the platform, passing, well, Tom Hanks' last film, Greyhound. That's good for Apple TV Plus, and is likely the record will continue to be broken as they release more and more big films, but for now, Tom Hanks owns it. For Netflix, they just released their biggest film of the year, Red Notice, the $200 million film with The Rock. Ryan Reynolds and Gal Gadot, and while reviews have been poor so far, it is delivering the numbers Netflix wanted. Under their new number system, which I will go over next week, on its opening weekend, Red Notice was watched over 148.7 million hours by subscribers, and it is the biggest opening for the Netflix, any Netflix movie so far. Will it be enough to do a sequel? That's not clear, and we need to see how long it stays in the top 10 as well. If it drops off quick, say, due to poor word of mouth, I doubt Netflix would spend another $200 million on the sequel. Now let's get to Disney Plus Day, where compared to last year, this year kind of sucked. One thing I noticed this year was that there was very uneven in terms of content between the studios. The biggest news came from Marvel, Star Wars, where we got some behind-the-scenes look at the Kenobi series, and that's about it. Pixar and uh, Disney Animated Studios, there was a lot of updates on stuff we already knew about, that was already announced, and there were some new live-action projects, but nothing huge. Going back to Marvel, we got updates on the shows already announced, as well as some new ones coming. The biggest of those is Agatha House of Harkness, which will focus on Agatha from WandaVision. I did like the character from the show, so having a spin-off focused on her is a good idea. The second new live-action show is called Echo, which is based on a character we will see in Hawkeye. What If is getting a second season. Spider-Man gets an animated series called Spider-Man Freshman Year. This will be canon to the MCU, as it will show Peter at the beginning of high school and how he became Spider-Man. Also for nostalgia, X-Men animated series is coming back as X-Men 97. And finally, for another spinoff, we are getting a Marvel Zombies animated series. So yeah, there was nothing huge, and a lot of new projects announced will not be coming until 2023 at the earliest. That does not mean 2022 is lacking content. It's already looking better than this year because, besides Star Wars and Marvel content, you got stuff like the live-action version of Pinocchio with Tom Hanks. I wonder if, since a lot of these shows have been made during the pandemic, it's causing them to be hesitant about announcing new stuff as they plan more of it out. That's a likely scenario, and I hope it's the case, because if this is them putting their best foot forward, I don't think it's enough. And that's it for this week's episode of Box Office Receipts. Question for the episode is, did you see Red Notice over the weekend? And if so, what did you think of it? Let me know on Facebook, link to the page in the show notes. Thank you for listening.